Welcome to Shattered Reality with your hosts Kate Valentine and Farusha. Prepare to have your paradigms shifted and your truths questioned. And now, Shattered Reality. Shattered Reality. Hey, Kate. Hi, hi, Sharusha. Well, it's another episode, and we're still here. Yes, uh, thank, thank oh, goodness. And today we have a wonderful, wonderful guest. So if you'd like to introduce him, that'd be terrific. Well, I do want to introduce him, but mm-hmm. I want to date our podcast first. Okay. T- t- if you don't mind. No. Today no, is fine. April 26th, oh, okay. 2016, mm-hmm. and um, today's guest is an extremely accomplished gentleman. He is an emeritus professor of philosophy and the former chair of the department at the University of Maryland, Baltimore. Currently, he is the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Scientific Exploration. He is a past president of the Parapsychological Association, and he is the author of six books and more than 60 essays, and the recipient of numerous awards, grants and fellowships and now Stephen Browdy PhD welcome your lordship alias Steve (laughs) thank you for having me on oh it's uh, thank you so much for being with us great book yeah we were recently looking over your book I think it's your second to latest book I'm not sure the gold leaf lady and um, it really falls in line uh, with a couple of other guests that we've been having, one of whom is also a former professor of philosophy, um, Dr. Michael Grosso, who has yes, been... Yes, a good friend. Oh, good. Who has been uh, working on the... the uh, now I'm not going to say the problem, the phenomena of levitation. And then we've had Ross Dunseeth on, who's not a professor of philosophy, but an electrical engineer. And in different ways, both of these gentlemen do seem to work with uh, psychokinesis, or PK. And um, so you and your gold leaf lady um come right in line with that and maybe you could kind of bring that together for us or more for our listeners how pk is involved with micro pk and and macro pk and levitation could you kind of just kind of sew that all together for us steve sure um well pk or psychokinesis very roughly just means mind over matter and the usual assumption about pk is that if it occurs, it has to do with a direct effect of one's mental states on things outside the body, like making objects move or affecting random event generators, things like that. But as a matter of fact, we don't really know whether or not PK is involved in some other phenomena that we don't also understand, like uh, hypnotic phenomena or placebo effects or psychosomatic ailments where the effects could be directed toward one's own body, for all we know. Mm. So I think we need, we need to leave that open as at least a, an option in logical space. But basically, it just means mind over matter. So producing f- physical effects without the usual kinds of intermediaries that we're familiar with, you know, like pushing or various kinds of obvious causal chains. This would be a direct effect of the mind on the world. I see. Yes, indeed. So... Um the use of of affecting um, random number generators is more in the area of most of the time micro PK small Correct. effects Correct. on on a, on a machine an electrical system uh, whereas something like levitation or moving things around is more what we would call macro PK correct so um, your book The Gold Leaf Lady begins uh, with the first instance in the book is that of a woman in Florida um, and uh, her adventures with producing uh, a substance on her body. Uh, Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Sure. This is somebody whose body would break out spontaneously and also instantaneously in a kind of golden colored foil, a very thin foil, sort of like the wrapping on Hershey's Kisses, but even finer. Mm. And let me just back up for a second. One of the things about Katie, that's her name, 
is that her case began sort of like a, a poltergeist case. And perhaps your listeners know that uh, the typical profile of a poltergeist case is that you have a disturbed uh, teenager or adolescent or somebody or other with deep emotional problems, but no convenient or conventional way of expressing them or dealing with them. And so it seems as though the poltergeist phenomena attached to the person, we know that because if the person moves, the phenomena tend to follow. But when this person has these intense emotions and no way to release them conveniently or obviously, it's like it's kind of brute psychic flailing about. So the person has these feelings and goes woof, as it were, and things fly around or shatter or um, burst into flame or whatever it might be. And Katie's psychic abilities, and there are several of them actually, uh, didn't appear until she married her second husband. And by all accounts, it was a difficult and perhaps even abusive uh, relationship. And early on, various kinds of poltergeist-like things were happening to Katie. So objects were appearing and disappearing, moving from one place in the house to another place in the house, or furniture rearranging itself, things like that. And then one day, a carving set appeared out of nowhere. Oh my. And, and Katie's husband said, what good is it if it isn't money? And then t two days later, Katie's body started to break out in what l looked like this golden foil. Oh. But it wasn't gold. It turned out to be brass. Huh. That is 80% uh, copper, 20% zinc. Mm -hmm. So if you want my pop psychological analysis of this, it's that symbolically this allowed Katie to satisfy her husband's demand for something valuable. Huh. But she didn't really have to bear the responsibility of being the goose that laid the golden egg which I think would be a very weighty responsibility. Oh, yes, indeed. Oh, yes. Wow. And, what happened to the goose? <laughs> <laughs> right. Even more than that, I think this was a, a very interesting way for Katie to express what I imagine was her considerable rage against her husband. I think she felt trapped in the marriage. <clears throat> and so she wasn't really giving her husband what he wanted. He wanted something valuable, and she was giving him brass. Mm. She was giving him fool's gold. It was a way of giving him the psychic finger. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. So this was only one of Katie's interesting abilities. She was um, she had only a first grade education, and uh, so she was functionally illiterate. She knew how to write her name. She knew the letters of the alphabet, but she couldn't form words or sentences. But when she was in a dissociative or mediumistic trance, she would write out quatrains in medieval French and Latin, ostensibly from Nostradamus. Wow. No, when she uh, so she actually wrote these with a yes. pen on paper. Yes. I mean, it wasn't that she dictated it to someone else. She was no, she wrote doing it. the writing. No, she wrote it in that's, cursive. That's and, rather and interesting. You met her and you mm -hmm. saw her produce some gold leaf. Yes. Yeah, one time I was just sitting across the dinner table from her and suddenly some a little piece of foil appeared on her face. Hmm. Now, I was watching her all this time because that's why I was there. Mm -hmm. And um, her hands were nowhere near her face. So it was clear that neither she nor her husband, who was seated next to her, uh, had placed it there. It was just suddenly there. Hmm. And amazing. there's a lot of firsthand testimony from other people who've, for example, held her hand when she felt that something was about to happen. And they've seen the entire hand and arm erupt in large quantities of foil. Hmm. That's one of the reasons the case is so strong. Wow. Has it been um, photographed or videoed? Yes. Um, but there's only one video record of the foil actually appearing. I mean, the problem was that Katie had no control over this. So, hmm. you know, we would follow her around with video cameras, which in those days weren't as light as they are now. And wait for something to happen, but usually as soon as you put it down, something would happen. Um, but one time we were just, the usual protocol for studying Katie was we'd bring her into a, a room with video cameras, one or more set up. We'd seat her in a chair. We'd ask her to lift up her shirt so we could see there was nothing concealed under her shirt because sometimes her abdomen would break out in large quantities. Hmm. And... I would inspect her hair, her hands, and look very carefully. And um, her main investigator, psychiatrist and physician, would examine her a little bit more minutely in the privacy of the bathroom. 
Um, so we were absolutely sure that there was no foil stashed anywhere nearby. And usually when the foil was about to appear, Katie would feel some kind of precursor. There would be a kind of itching or irritation. And there was only one camera on this occasion. And I saw Katie put her finger up to her eye and rub it and then look at her finger. Apparently something was about to happen near her eye and she was looking on her finger to see if anything came off when she rubbed her eye. The problem is, when I saw her do this, there was only one camera, I zoomed in to get a close-up shot. But when Katie looked at her hand, she took her hand out of camera range. And then she put her hand back on her eye to rub it again, and then suddenly there was something on her eye. Mm -hmm. Now, I know she didn't dip her hand into some golden foil. There was none. And what that means is that the one record that I've been able to get, and as far as I know, the only record that exists of the foil actually appearing, is somewhat compromised as evidence because you don't you don't really see the whole picture. Wow. It's always the way. You know, like yeah. you photograph a UFO and boom, you're out of range or your battery's dead or... Yes, the battery goes but, but you made a great point in your book, too, that the reason the paranormal stays paranormal is that it is so sporadic. You just can't ever nail it down. And that this is a perfect example of that. I mean, I'm quite sure this woman does have this, whatever, this unique uh, Ability? property. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, so... You know, it. Have you heard of other cases like this? I, I have never heard of anything like this. No, this one's one of a kind. Yeah. Um, yeah. There have been other cases of people whose bodies would erupt in oils or something like that. But, mm -hmm. um, what's interesting about this, I mean, a lot of people thought it looked like Katie was sweating the foil. Mm -hmm. But that there are several reasons why I reject that. One is that she'd have to have lethal amounts of copper and zinc in her system. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and none of the medical tests ever done on Katie showed anything like that. And secondly, sometimes the foil apparently appeared in objects around the room and on her clothing. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Huh. Now, I, I have to say, I didn't see that happen, but um, a number of other witnesses did, and I have no reason to doubt their testimony. Hmm. Is, is Katie still living? You know, I lost touch with Katie when Bert Schwartz, her main investigator, died a few years ago. Oh. Uh, what I heard shortly before that is that she had been in a protracted, drunken stupor with her husband, oh. which apparently happened periodically in the relationship. Oh, oh my. Um, but she sounds like a very disturbed person. No, she was actually a, a really nifty person. She, she? Yeah, but I think because of her lack of education... Um, and for all I know, other reasons too. She felt trapped in the marriage. She didn't mm -hmm. really f feel that she could be as independent as she would like to be. And mm. Who? You know, Go ahead. I'm sorry. Didn't well, you know, lethal relationships can be very difficult to get out of. Yes, yes, indeed and, they can. <laughs> and hers was one of those. But wow. Katie, I think, was actually a, a very well-grounded person. She just okay. had these remarkable abilities. Okay. The papers that she wrote these quatrains on... Um, where are they? Have you been able to preserve them? Did um, Bert Schwartz preserve them? Uh, what happened to them? I don't have the originals. Um, Bert's articles were all uh, scanned and made available to various people on DVDs. Uh, I have them. So they were, many of the papers were um, photographed and published. Interesting. But I, I don't know where the originals are. Um, I just, uh, I believe I remember you had having written that the uh, gold foil was analyzed, yes? Yes, <clears throat> that's how we know it's brass. Yes. Um, but I also had the structure looked at. It was funny, I took it to the uh, material science department at Johns Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And the chair of the department and some of his colleagues were certainly fascinated by the case. And I asked them to take a look at the foil and see what, what we had there. And what they determined, and what has subsequently been confirmed by some analytical chemists I also took it to, is that the foil is virtually identical to stuff you can buy in art supply stores that's called um, Dutch metal or composition leaf. Uh -huh. It's a kind of cheap version of gold leaf that you see on picture frames. So if you want to do something like uh -huh. that but not actually buy gold, this is an, an alternative. 
an altar of the way to go. Ah. Now, that's interesting, but it doesn't really help us figure out what's going on. The thing is that the guys at Johns Hopkins lost interest immediately when they realized that the structure of the foil was just regular rolled brass leaf. And they were making the assumption, which I think is false, that if it was paranormally produced, it had to be wildly an anomalous when you looked at its structure. Oh. Mm -hmm. But that right. doesn't follow at all. No, it doesn't. It, uh, it's just, um, I believe, what you call an apport is something that was transported from elsewhere. That's what I was hoping to determine by having it looked at by some analytical chemists. I had, <clears throat> I started having people look at about 30 different samples of foil taken from Katie, and then I gave them some control samples of um, composition leaf purchased in the Maryland, Pennsylvania area, and then we were going to compare it to um, foil taken from the, the area around Florida to see if it looked more like one than the other. But for various reasons I describe in the book, um, that laborious analysis was never completed. Okay. <clears throat> um, and uh, Katie was not a willing, I mean, she didn't will this to happen. This was... Not, not consciously, certainly. Right. Which, it was an affliction. You know, she could go to the 7-Eleven and try to buy something, and while she was checking out, the foil could appear on her face. Oh, oh she God. didn't want that happening. No, know? I would imagine not. Um, which brings us to the question of, of volition in certain of these cases of various things happening to people, such as levitation or apports or things of this nature. And... Um, if something is volitional, like um, I guess Dee Dee Hume was volitionally uh, levitating as opposed to uh, the young lady in the Enfield um, right. case of the... Um, or even Joseph. Joseph, Joseph of Cupertino. Or um, <laughs> other saints, both Catholic saints and Hindu saints have been right. seen levitating. Um, so if it's not volitional, is it a poltergeist type activity energies built up within the person or is it a third party um an, in <laughs> an invisible party if you will i mean what are the options there well those are two of the main options um it's really hard to know i mean it's not as if you can go around with a pk meter and figure out where the causal lines really are right um and it's one of the frustrating things about studying psychic functioning. And one of the reasons I've been arguing for decades now that it's premature to bring it into the lab because we have no idea what the role of psychic functioning in life really is. I mean, people have lots of ideas about that, but we don't know what its natural history is. You know, we can study, to some extent, memory under laboratory conditions because we have some idea what memory is in day-to-day -day life. But we don't know what the natural history of psychic functioning is. We don't know, you know, there's no way to tell the difference between um, a car crash caused by normal forces or one produced psychokinetically. The only difference, as far as we know, could be in their underlying causal histories, which are unobservable. Right, right. So until we get a handle on what kind of voluntary and involuntary role Psy might be playing in life, um, we really don't know what it is we're trying to bring into the lab and whether what we're bringing into the lab is inappropriate f for even being studied there, much in the way that sensuality would be inappropriate to study under lab conditions or athletic abilities. Right, right. Yeah, I don't think it's something you really can, uh, I, you know, obviously you can't put it in a test tube and measure, you know, micrograms per whatever. Uh, but I think it should be, I think there's a lot of, uh, uh, one of the reasons I think paranormal should be studied a lot more is because there is a lot about so-called science that we don't know, and that that's the gateway to it. Uh, I really believe that this thing happened to this woman for whatever reason. and um, But there are some volitional cases. A good friend of mine had PK ability and could move things at will. <clears throat> and whenever she used to do it as a joke, actually, um, you know, just to see people's reaction, and she used to laugh about it. But yeah, she definitely uh, she never thought it was anything unusual. She thought everybody had that ability. But the thing is, once you allow any PK to uh -huh. exist, mm -hmm. no matter how apparently insignificant, 
it opens a kind of Pandora's box. So mm -hmm. if, if somebody can move a compass needle or a cigarette a millimeter by thought alone, mm -hmm. it's a very small step conceptually from doing that to making somebody drop dead by thought alone. Oh, so and so, say, I'm spokesperson for the dark side. I mm -hmm. have to admit that. So the existence of any psychokinesis at all forces us to take seriously a kind of magical worldview that most of us associate, usually condescendingly, only with so-called primitive cultures. And it's mm -hmm. a worldview where uh, thoughts can kill or have other sorts of nasty consequences, and in which we might have to bear responsibility for a range of things we would just as soon be bystanders for. Well, what about the 6%, Steve, that um, intention plays uh, purportedly, I don't know if it's Dean Radin or somebody of that nature, has seemed to have come up with the idea that you can influence things ordinary people can influence things by 6% by intention. And um, have you heard about that? Is that something? No, I actually hadn't heard about that one. But it, it, I mean, the thing is, we don't know what people can do unconsciously. That's with, true. When all restraints are removed, when our usual sense sensors are uh, not even in play. Mm. Well, um, it, it's reportedly said that anybody who intends towards a, a, a reasonable goal or even, an, a, you know, a high goal, like, you know, if I wanted to be a movie actress or something, I can push things 6% in that direction, even if I am not particularly psychic, but just have a, a reasonable amount of focus. And if you add um, five people all doing the same thing, um, you know, it, does that multiply it? But that's just, it, this is just a hypothetical question. I don't expect well, to, you I, know. I think it does. Like the cheering crowds at a home team definitely gives home a team home team advantage. advantage. Yes. You see the elections going on now. Certainly it's a lot of people getting together and, you know, backing one candidate or the other. And we will not get into politics. Will no, we? we will not. No, we will definitely not. Well, I got to say, I don't think it's that it. straightforward. Uh-huh. What, 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 why not? I mean, you know, there's an old argument that if thoughts could kill, how come mm -hmm. Hitler lived so long? Well, because um, I don't think a lot of people were willing to kill him. I think the number of people willing to kill him were much less than the ones that were not, uh, the immediate people surrounding him. Well, that's I, why I don't think it's some sort of simple calculation by, mm -hmm. in, in terms of the number of people who might share the same intention. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, if intentions, both conscious and unconscious, can be efficacious in the world then there's going to be this unobservable but presumably immeasurably vast underlying network of potentially psi-conducive intentions well, going on, crisscrossing well, one another, sure. canceling each other out. Well, well, look what Goebbels did with the propaganda in that era. I think he was just opening up that whole er area. And uh, I think he was sort of a genius, an evil one perhaps, but... If you, deny, out, if you tell the a big lie, lie. yeah, the the, big enough lie. times it'll be believed. And that's that's sort I of guess, a borderline psychological and mm -hmm. psychic. Well, I think I think that's Steve's point is that where does one begin and where does the other lay out? In in terms of uh, in terms of studying psi functioning, um, perhaps a better group of individuals to study it rather than laboratory psychology would be anthropology um, or even physics. What do you think about that? Well, I think what parapsychology really needs is more people like the late Jewel Eisenbud, people who have a, a nose for subtle regularities in the world. Uh, Eisenbud was a psychiatrist and an unusually perceptive individual. And I've often thought that one of the best natural groups for study, if you want to understand the natural history of psi, is to look at people who are incredibly lucky or unlucky. Ah. Because this is a way in which I think yeah. um, our psi abilities might be marshaled mm -hmm. uh, for good or for harm. You know, there's an, there's an old Yiddish distinction between a shlemiel and a shlemazel. You know <laughs> a shlemiel is somebody who spills soup on himself and a schlamazel has it spilt on him. <laughs> so the idea is that schlamazels are unlucky souls, people that the universe is crapping on. You know, uh, 
people who are victims of impersonal forces or the universe at large. And schlamozzles really exist. I was actually married to a schlamozzle. <laughs> oh, dear. I'd rather not discuss that case. So let me yeah. tell you about that, another That's right case. up there with politics. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you don't I, want to put that on audio for the uh, posterity of the internet, I don't think. Actually, her entire family was a lightning rod for misfortune, but that's another story. <laughs> Did they have bad self-images? Just being, the, you know, I'm, I'm a psychic reader, so be, for me to be the devil's advocate is rather odd, but... Did they have negative self-images, do you think? I think, yeah, to some extent. And so I think that this kind of unluckiness is a kind of externalized analog to psychosomatic ailments. Uh Uh-huh. And I lived next door to some schlamozzles at one point. I mean, <laughs> I, I'd like to know if they were schlamozzles before they met and got married. And there's no way to find that out now. Oh, oh but dear. there's no doubt that their life was a, together was a living hell of aggravations and annoyances. It seemed like everything they bought was defective. <laughs> their cars were in the shop, even though they both drove brands noted for their reliability. Um, Electronic equipment would fail to work right out of the box. A solid wooden rocking chair bought the second day they had it with their infant son on board. Um, And my favorite example of their schlamozzleness, if that's even a word, (laughs) is that the wife bought a poster-sized photograph of what she thought was uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, and she had it framed and put on her living room wall. Mm -hmm. And I had to tell her, Donna, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. (laughs) So here's a woman who both symbolically and literally bought the Brooklyn Bridge, which maybe some of your that, younger listeners don't know that that's an old image of the that's sucker. Bought, bought the Brooklyn Bridge, indeed. That indeed. is so symbolic. That's perfect. So That's absolutely perfect. That, that is a funny story. <laughs> Getting back... Um, perhaps at this juncture in the um, in the interview, the <laughs> you you would like to um, mention some of the names of your books for our listeners oh, good, to good. and and one of your books on Amazon costs four hundred and sixty three dollars. Whoa! So, yeah, <laughs> cheap at half the price. <laughs> it, it, it must it must be uh, out of, a hardback out of version yeah. of a old edition or something. Yeah. Like it, perhaps that. It, it. I think it's the uh, influence the. Um, no, you can buy the limits of influence yes. a new edition for yes. under forty dollars. <laughs> well, it, I just happen. It's always really impressive when you see that mm-hmm. somebody's a living author's books are right. worth over a hundred dollars. Right. I mean, well, that's uh, when I signed in blood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the Shalmazel's blood, not yeah. even your own. <laughs> so, uh, so my books. <laughs> So uh, my first book was called ESP and Psychokinesis, which I now think of as a kind of immature work. It dealt mostly with um, laboratory evidence and parapsychology before I had um, moved on to more interesting and I think more relevant kinds of manifestations of psi. So my second book was the one you just mentioned, The Limits of Influence, uh, which deals primarily with physical mediumship or macro PK. Mm-hmm. Um, then I took a little detour and wrote a book on multiple personality and the philosophy of mind. That book is called First Person Plural. And the reason I did that was I knew at some point I wanted to write a book on the evidence for survival of death. But I also knew that a lot of what you see in cases of multiple personality looks a whole lot like what you see in some cases of mediumship or channeling. Uh So I figured I wouldn't be able to do a responsible job of writing about the evidence for survival until I really knew a lot about uh, dissociation, multiplicity, the history of hypnosis, and that whole cluster of issues. It is a very interesting uh, topic, especially when physical changes are seen in the subject uh, when they're transferring from one personality to another. Absolutely interesting. And... So much like what you see in some cases of mediumship that even if uh, the two turn out to be distinct phenomena, um, it's not just a a purely academic issue. It's one that needs to be addressed competently. And one of my disappointments with the general literature on survival is that the people who really write on survival are empirically myopic. They really haven't a clue what the uh, associated relevant issues in abnormal psychology are. So then I wrote my book on survival. By that time, I was chronologically challenged enough for it to be an appropriate thing to do. (laughs) Okay. Um, Well, that uh, brings me to another, um, again, to speak about the idea of an unseen party. Because, you know, 
I work as a psychic reader, and mm -hmm. I'm not making any vast claims, but I do speak to lots and lots of people, and often about um, survival issues, though I am not a trans medium. Sometimes I get quote-unquote messages from somewhere, I don't know where, and I uh, transmit them to the people. Um, but sometimes people come to me, and they have things going on that seem somewhat malevolent in nature. And um, I like to point out to them that when somebody appears to them in their dreams or uh, even in a vision of sorts and says it's their grandmother, that doesn't necessarily mean it is their grandmother. Correct. And so there's that edgy sort of thing going on. And and this comes when we begin to talk here, we do talk here about uh, UFOs somewhat frequently because Kate had a show uh, before this show called the Kate Valentine UFO Show, which is still True. available on the internet. Um, but um, often uh, the um, purported denizens of the UFOs would give information to the contactees or the experiencers and that information would be like true up to a point, and then it would be like lies. And I noticed and witnessed the same sort of thing with people who have had experiences with these sorts of uh, visions of the purportedly deceased. And I'm very careful to tell my clients that, um, you know, it may not be your Aunt Ruthie. Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things that's interested me about various cases of mediumship is that in, in many cases, the messages that come through ostensibly from deceased individuals, and so the messages that the medium delivers are the kinds of things which would be risky for the medium herself to say as if they were coming from his or her own mind. Mm. Um, a good example of that is a case I wrote about in Immortal Remains. It's a case called Patient's Worth, where this St. Louis housewife in the 1920s um, was channeling literary works and various kinds of uh, radical opinions about feminism, um, the emptiness of organized religion, and the evils of formal education. Things that, if she had expressed these opinions herself, she would have been roundly condemned. Right. But coming coming from Patient's Worth, mm -hmm. this character, um, the the medium Pearl Curran could disavow responsibility for it. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the important things about mediumship: that so long as you truly believe you're a medium, then you're off the hook, mm -hmm. no matter what's coming through you, mm -hmm. or even if nothing happens. I mean, hmm. you don't have to take any responsibility for successes or failures or even for the content of the messages. You can always attribute it to some um, mischievous communicator on the other side or to a weak link on the other side and so hmm. on. So your, so your point here is that, um, that there might, the person might have a subliminal desire to say these things, the actual medium, and uses this as a safe method of, of saying somewhat difficult things? or Not in all cases, certainly, but in some, I think so. And then I think we need, for that reason, to uh, look very sensitively at what might be going on analogous to that in other mm. cases. So in other words, if you wanted to tell someone they're Shamil and get out of the marriage, <laughs> that's a nicer way to do it, right? Uh, yes, after all, it's being, it's, you're not saying it, no. it's... This perceptive communicator. You know, I was wondering if I could just go back to what you said a, a while ago, and you were saying how some of these psi occurrences are much more acceptable in what would be called primitive societies. So that you're saying actually that social contracts really limit the ability to understand some of these psi effects. Uh, that's an interesting way to put it. Uh, yeah, I mean, if it turns out that this so-called primitive view of the way the world works mm -hmm. is in many ways closer to the way it actually yeah. works than the yeah. mechanistic scientific worldview. Um, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah. life gets a whole lot more interesting. So that that actually would probably be the place to start if I don't think there's any, in quotes, primitive societies left, but 
not with the advent. Of, and what do you think about the internet? But I mean, that that's a whole other question. But uh, but I don't think you could find someone that was really considered primitive and untouched. And but yeah, that would be the place to uh, start uh, examining. Oh, wait, 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 wait. There definitely are cultures still where um, mm, well, I, I, where th- people really are. don't. There are, but I mean, I, I think. It's sort of like, uh, you know, if you're running experiments, uh, you know, like in quantum mechanics, as soon as you see the experiment, you've already changed it. So just by... Experimenter effect. Yeah, yeah, just by being there. I mean, obviously, there's no other way to do it, but uh, you'd almost have to become a member of that society and then join up with them later, you know, as if they found you out in the jungle or something. I don't know, to really be able to do that. Well, but the takeaway point from all mm-hmm. this, I think, is that um, if these under-the-surface malevolent or benign uh, intentions can mm-hmm. actually manifest in reality, mm-hmm. then if those intentions are not things we can control, oh. Oh. then and if they're unconscious, then I think oh. they're probably very difficult to control. Okay. And I think very few of us never have nasty thoughts. So Mm -hmm. if we're capable of having nasty thoughts and then about a person and then that person has an accident, very few people in industrialized or developed countries, uh, I think, are comfortable with the idea that our thoughts may have had some role to play. But all this presupposes um, that um, there are, you know, that's a value judgment, that it's a nasty thought. Well, that's true, too. Uh, sure. I mean, so... Well, it's harmful, or you could say harmful. Like, but it, everything it, is harmful to something. Well, you know, mm-hmm. I think what you're saying, like, if they cut you off in, in a traffic jam, and then, you, you know, you really think very evil thoughts, and their car explodes, well, that's a bad thought. Yeah. yeah. I know. Well, it goes back to philosophy, you know, what is the good, you know? And we're talking to the <laughs> philosopher... Um, oh, oh, sorry. The, what's, what, what did we call him in the beginning? What did he want to be called? Your um, lordship. The lordship. Bill, your, your lordship. Your lordship. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm sorry. I but didn't. I do I do have... Um, there are a couple of questions that we do have left, one of which is from one of our listeners, which I will wait on until I ask my philosophical question. I just want to bring us back... Uh, because it, it, it seems to pervade a lot of these non-volitional things. Um, uh, when we talk about um, uh, the, uh, the, the people who are having um, issues uh, in their lives and produce perhaps PK, uh, move things or things burst into fire, we think that it could be uh, energies built up within themselves. Uh, when a person has a case of non-volitional levitation, uh, if we look at somebody like St. Joseph, we could say he had a lot of sexual energy built up and he, he just flew up to the ceiling. Um, but um, can we be sure that there isn't a third party actor here, that there isn't uh, an invisible actor? And when we talk about invisible actors and we talk about the unity of consciousness, the unity of beings, it, it becomes a, a real quandary to think about, at least for my uh, little mind, my little um, struggling brain or consciousness here, because I think about everybody being one, all, all consciousnesses from the moon to um, an earthworm to my cat to uh, you and me. Um, we're on some level we're all one so what about these invisible entities if they in fact exist and my experience kind of pushes me towards yeah they do exist but at what point do we all become one and does it all become a moot point or to have a really tied things in a knot there steve um maybe a little naughty i'm not (laughs) sure but um when you say invisible uh, entities, you know, they could be other people. I mean, so the schlamozzles, instead of doing these things to themselves, they could have, maybe it was their wicked next door neighbor philosopher who was doing it to them. For Uh-oh. All they knew. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. Lord so, <laughs> I'm really nice, Steve. I'm, we've been really nice to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm very happy with you, not to worry. Good, um, good, good. So, 
so if you're meaning something other than Humans, uh, yes. another human mind in yes. the mix, I don't. We don't have any independent confirmation that there are such. And I think the only way we'd ever get independent confirmation of that would be if there was evidence of uh, postmortem survival that we could really identify as such. And that's that's very 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 tricky. So you don't you don't um, you don't have any thoughts about things other than humans having consciousness. Oh yeah, I have lots of thoughts about that. <laughs> and uh, and I believe various non-humans have consciousness. So I don't limit consciousness to human beings. Okay. Um, That's where I was going, I guess. Oh, well, you know, it could be your dog Fido who is doing it to you for all you know. But <laughs> you know, you didn't feed Fido on time. <laughs> Evil little uh, beast. <laughs> 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 but where I can't follow you is this idea that we can e somehow neatly get to the idea that all consciousness is, is one. I don't see how, it's a, what the connection there is. I guess that's a spiritual concept, which is kind of new agey that has been sold uh, to people, uh, you know, largely in the past 40 years or so, but is part of, um, I think, the Eastern um meditational concepts of India and Tibet. Yeah, I'm familiar with the view. I just don't know how you get to it. Yeah. Uh, I, I, how I personally get to it? Or how one should get to it, whether there's a, um, whether it's just through some kind of intuition that it's correct. But I, think, I mean, to argue the way that you were arguing, I don't see how you get to it. Okay. Yeah, I, th I would say that the way a person, not me necessarily, might get to that point of view is through a transcendent experience or like a, um, um, yeah, a transcendent experience or a, 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 a Kundalini rising type experience, that sort of a thing. That's very tricky. One of the lessons we've learned, I think, from the history of modern philosophy, or even ancient philosophy for that matter, any philosophy that um, bases the fundamental truths on statements that are presumably intuited to be true, mm -hmm. there's, there's a question that shows immediately what's wrong with it. How do you how do you know intuitively whether uh, something that appears to you to be clear and distinct is actually clear and distinct? Or does it just appear to be? And there is no internal umpire that can guarantee you a correct answer to that question. I, I, well, I would agree. My, yeah. my father had a good answer to that when I was doing philosophy in school. And he said, yeah, I'll tell you one thing, kid. You stub your toe, it hurts, all right? <laughs> <laughs> that sort of set it down for me from there on in. Empirical evidence. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, okay, all right. <laughs> Well, but I, I think that, that, again, is a point. You know, there are people who uh, do indeed are just very, very Newtonian, I guess, for want of a better word. I mean, I think a lot of people are. And uh, it works. It works very well. It works extremely well in most people's lifestyle. The shut up and calculate model? Well, why not? I mean, yeah. it, you know, it works great. You, you know, even the schmozzle next door has, can <laughs> buy a car. It may fail, but they can buy one. And they bought the bridge, <laughs> <laughs> which is absolutely the best. But... Uh, you know, and I think that's another reason people are so reluctant to get into any of the paranormal or it frightens them because their lives are very well regulated and they run nicely. And, you know, all this other stuff is sort of scary and it's unexplained and it just may mess everything up. And I, I think that's part of the problem. It's it's also um, losing control. Mm -hmm. What yeah. I find with the... Um, you know, the ra uh, rabid materialists, the scientism crowd, is that um, they're largely men and they're really afraid of losing control. And so it sort of all feeds into that from my point of view. Um, just speaking to some individuals of that nature, there comes a point where they start to get really nervous and their eyes start to glaze over and they just are negative. No, no, no. And, and you feel like they have the idea that they're losing control. This can't possibly be because what it means, if it's true, is that they're not on the top of the food chain or um, somebody else might have uh, secret powers over them or whatever like that. I agree. It leads to very interesting behaviors. I mean, yes. I've been talking about PK for decades and 
I can just see the panic in the audience uh, when I do that. And what I see is that people who really should know better start attacking me with kinds of reasoning that they know to be effect defective and whose defects they would be very quick to point out if the same kinds of arguments were ever directed against them. Yeah. Yes, indeed. So it's well, like a veil of stupidity descends over them when, when this happens. Or protection. But, I mean, the classic is NASA, who absolutely just scoffs at UFOs, and yet we've sent UFOs to Mars. Uh, you know, if you were a Martian and something was circling your planet, it certainly would be a UFO. So that actually NASA has created them, but just cannot accept the fact that there's another sentient being that could do the same thing to us. Or that people in their own ranks mm. um, have defected and said that they have seen UFOs. Most pertinent of whom was, who's the guy with the um, the Martian guy? I think you had him on that had uh, was talking about that. Oh, Brandenburg? Yeah. yeah. He was a NASA employee for years, yeah. right? Kind of high up. But we, we are sorry. going afield yeah, here. Okay, okay. Um, in any case, let's get to our listener question. Okay. Our okay. listener question uh, comes from a lady who is a regular listener and has also seen videos on the internet where a young lady in the Middle East produces crystals from her eyes. And I said, I thought that it had been debunked that her father had uh, forced her to put this in her t uh, tear canals or something. Or what, what do you know about that, if anything, or is it just... Something I actually don't know about that, but I do know about um, some psychics who've ostensibly made crystals appear in their eyes. I also know that it is possible to um, put them in there ahead of time and then make them mm -hmm. come up. Secret them away. Yes. Um, and, and I assume that you are also a... Um, uh, somebody who knows Stanley Krippner, and oh, he, sure. he has had some very, very interesting cases of um, apports appearing when he was in South America. Yes. Have, yes. Have, he's Stan spoken? has great, great he's, stories. He's a great guy. I, I happen to have met him in Brooklyn, and uh, he has, has wonderful stories about that, and, and I think that I am, I'm more likely to believe him than most people. Um, before we go, um, maybe I'd like to talk a little about the, the Ted Sirios case. Uh, it's a case close to my heart. Um, well, I think it's probably the best documented case of macro PK uh, in the 20th century. Ted was a, a former bellhop in Chicago who discovered that he had the ability to make images appear on instant, so-called instant Polaroid film. And he was studied for three years by Jewel Eisenbett, a psychiatrist located at the time in Denver. And during that time, Ted produced thousands of uh, anomalous photos under conditions that really can't be uh, explained away. I mean, he could be separated from the camera. He could be um, clothed in a one-piece jump monkey suit by the experimenters. Um, located in a Faraday cage. The camera could be on the outside of the cage, sometimes as much as 60 feet away from him. Wow. And he even got correspondences uh, between his photos and concealed target images, which he'd never seen. Hmm. Interesting. Very the interesting. case is very interesting. The distortions of real objects that um, he produced in his photos are, according to Eisenbud, clues to what was really going on in Ted's unconscious. So, I mean, there was a, a photo that Ted produced of Eisenbud's ranch, which depicts the ranch in a condition in which it existed before Ted had ever been there, and also at the same time depicted it in other respects in conditions in which it had never existed. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. Did they ever find any, um, was there ever any explanation of any sort for that, or is it just... Oh, skeptics like to claim that uh, Ted produced these by concealing little transparencies in a rolled up piece of black paper that Ted called a gizmo. This piece of black paper was what came in packs of Polaroid film, mm -hmm. and Ted used it as just a, a crutch, as a device. He would sometimes hold it right up to the camera. Mm -hmm. um, but sometimes he didn't have a gizmo at all. Sometimes the gizmo was quite a distance from the camera. It's, it's a completely lame explanation. Yes. If, if Ted were concealing a, a, 
the transparency in the gizmo, he'd have to hold it right up to the camera lens. Otherwise, the camera would take a picture of the gizmo, not the transparency. So the fact that he was separated from the camera by considerable distances rules that out. Also, Ted produced so-called blackies and whiteies. Blackies were um, totally underexposed pictures in conditions when light was not prevented from reaching the lens. Mm. And whiteies were totally overexposed pictures um, when all light was blocked from reaching the lens. Mm. So the gizmo hypothesis, or the transparency in the gizmo hypothesis, is completely mute on that subject. So it's just nonsense. Well, that's really, really interesting. In this case, not in the case of, uh, I mean, in the gen generic sense of producing photographs, um, there have been people who um, appear to be frauds. Um, and so it's natural for somebody who was is a skeptic and not a debunker, debunkers we don't like here on Shattered Reality, but skeptics we we consider we you know give the skeptic the the point to to say something if they'd like um fair and balanced fair and balanced right um and um when we take somebody like this fellow in um in the netherlands uh robert, robert vanderbrook yes and a purport now i don't know the man i haven't seen him i'm not making a judgment on him i just want to to clear myself legally, but it, for all intents and purposes, it would appear to be fraudulent. I've heard that, but again, I don't know the case intimately enough to, to know what to say. I'd be very happy to study him myself under my conditions. Right, right. And it would be interesting if you would, certainly. Um, and given that there is the option for fraud, I do understand why there are people who are skeptics who want to look deeply into these issues, but I have no time for the debunkers, those people who, uh, you know, uh, drum up uh, bad arguments against you, fraudulent uh, logic and so forth. Um, Good for you. But that's one of the reasons the Ted Sirius case is important, because Polaroid photos being instantly developed right in front of your eyes, mm -hmm. you can't attribute the effects to darkroom techniques, for example. So, so actually what you're saying is this fellow had a picture in his mind for whatever reason, let's say he, the psychiatrist ranch, and he was able to manipulate the, the atoms on a photograph film to represent this. With, I mean, it's hard enough to draw it with a pen and paper, and he's able to just change atoms or silver, iodide, whatever it is on the Polaroid films, just turning them around darkening some, lightening others to represent. So it seemed, yeah. Wow, that's pretty remarkable. It is, really. Uh, I, 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 you know, it's just like UFO. It's so unbelievable, it's unbelievable, but it actually happens. And so what do you, how do you, what, how do you deal with that? And with the, the blackies and the whiteies, one is tempted, Underexposed, overexposed. tempted to say that there's got to be some transmission Something. of energy there to make that happen well, obviously uh, you know i don't know what to say there there are no. some interesting philosophical issues about what kind of causality we're talking about when um we're discussing these kinds of phenomena is it uh something produced through a series of steps along the way or is it really like mm. waving a magic wand where you just wish for an outcome and then assuming there's a clearing in the thicket it just occurs hmm. that there there are no series of intermediate steps. It's really just the direct cause and effect. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting, interesting. And so maybe we shouldn't try to explain it; just accept it. Oh, well, the human mind minute. is dying to explain things. Well, but really, why? I mean, what, what what's the drive to explain? I mean, it happened, and that's it. But wait, there are different kinds of explanation. The, mm -hmm. <laughs> what, what most scientists assume is that what it means to explain a phenomenon like this mm -hmm. is to break it down into component parts and explain right. it mechanistically. And the way right. we explain heat is molecular motion. Right. But I don't think, you know, vertical analysis or, ana or explanation by analysis mm -hmm. uh, into lower level phenomena, that has to stop somewhere. Yeah. Most scientists assume it's always at the level of the very small, the atomic, subatomic, neurophysiological, something like that, Physics and never the at the level of behavior. Physics. What oh. I would say is that sometimes it really is at the level of behavior, mm -hmm. and there, there are other kinds of explanation, like mm. in terms of some supervening law. Mm. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. 
I, 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 really, I, I, not much to say. I mean, how do you explain that you like blue and you don't like yellow? I mean, it's because you don't, and that's it. Right. Right. No explanation needed past that. Good, good. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 don't be sorry. I like blue and yellow, oh, Kate. Well, 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 there's no explanation well, for that. Just, I mean, you, you have to like one or the other. You know, it's just chocolate or vanilla, okay? Yeah, I, could, I could join in that. Um, I, I think you raised some really interesting questions. I, I think it's very important that some people start to follow in uh, your footsteps as well. Because it, it opens a whole new avenue of thought, thinking about the world, and that, that's what's important. Bef, bef, I was going to do this after we said goodbye to you, mm -hmm. but I have decided to say it during the time mm -hmm. we're speaking with you, if you have another four minutes or so. Well, uh, first, okay. The first thing is that um, we are welcoming our listeners to send in instances of PK that they would like to talk to us about or would like recounted or even if perhaps they would like a five minute or ten minute slot to explain their stories on on um, Shattered Reality podcast. Um, but somewhat uh, unusually last night I had my own very strange experience that I want to relate mm. and it was not frightening but it was damned strange. I was in a building, a two-story building, Center Hall Colonial Building, standing at the top of the stairway. And um, there was, was a bedroom in my view, uh, w which I could see the door to. And in this house lived two cats, a red cat and a black cat. And I saw the, red, the black cat run in to the bedroom across from the stairway. I'm standing at the top of the stairway. The black cat runs in the bedroom and I speak down the stairway to the man who, whose bedroom it was. And I said, does that cat often go into your room or spend time in your room? Because the cat is a former feral cat and is not very friendly to the man. So I was very surprised to see the cat running into his bedroom. He was seated on a sofa at the bottom of the stairs, uh, was halfway in my view. And as he was answering, and I was coming down the stairs, the one and only black cat in the house ran out of the dining room from downstairs. Hmm. So it couldn't have, I mean, he did not pass me. Hmm. The cat did not pass me. This all happened within 20 seconds of each other. Somehow, he, the cat, entered one bedroom and came out of another bedroom from which there was no egress or ingress. Yeah. Cats are very strange creatures, and there's so many stories about them. A Cheshire cat, I, I, just so many. Well, one very interesting story about me with a cat was I just moved into an apartment. There was absolutely nothing in this one room. I had a cat that I needed to bring with me. And uh, so I figured, fine. I shut the doors to the room, got the carrier, went back in. There was no cat there. Uh, and this was in an apartment. It wasn't as if it was an old house with a lot of places. So I'm looking all over. Not there, not there. And I'm like, wow. So I'm looking, I'm looking. I look through the rest of the apartment, kept the doors closed. Went back into that room, and the cat's sitting on top of the table. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the chest our cat grin. And, I mean, I'm thinking, like, oh, I probably overlooked it somewhere. But then I'm looking around the room, and there's absolutely nowhere for the cat to hide. But there's a lot of strange stories about cats. Cats, you should start studying cats. Now, that's an interesting species. Well, you <laughs> yes. can understand why they have are considered more oh. than dogs to have mystical powers. Oh, I, they do. They do. They, they absolutely do. do. But they that do. that happened. To, I happened to want to document that because this happened last night. Mm -hmm. And... I wasn't afraid at the time. It just was so bizarre. But after it happened and my mind was mm -hmm. rolling it around, I said, hmm, yep. hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, Steve, thank you so much. It was just wonderful to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. I really appreciate it. It was a great Great. It was a great hour. Thank and, you. And, and we hope you'll come on again and maybe speak to us more about the survival of, uh, you know... Uh, the species? No, well, that's <laughs> not going to happen, but uh, so, uh, by, uh, survival of bodily death. Uh, sure. Uh, Have your people call my people. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, your lordship. <laughs> <laughs> yes, indeed. Thank you. Okay, our, thank our, you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye now. 
Wow. Okay. That wow. Was a, yeah, it shattered is. reality. Here yeah. we are. Well, well, my reality has been somewhat shattered. Um, really? I, I'm not really a big psi person. You know that. I, you but I, yeah, I know, I know. But I don't think of myself that way. You know, but uh, that was a true story with the cat. That's that was unbelievable. A better uh, talking about black cats. We uh, had one. It was a feral cat. Couldn't do it, but it lived with us for eight years. Mm -hmm. Tragically, was killed by a car. Mm -hmm. I felt terribly. Without going into a lot of detail, about a week later, I was leaving the driveway across the street. A little black kitten comes frisking across. Same type gait with the tail held in the same way. Turned, looked at me, and then sort of just wandered off. I never saw it oh, again. Oh, really? Yeah, it was his way of coming back and saying goodbye, I'm sure. I had a, a, a feral cat mm -hmm. named Rusty Buster, mm -hmm. and he, he, he told me before he was leaving mm -hmm. that he was leaving, and mm -hmm. then he disappeared and was never seen again. Mm -hmm. um, and we really wanted him to come back. You know, we intended that he should come back. And who shows up? Um, you know, uh, but Charles in a, in a different situation, and, and here he was a red cat also and had a lot of the same nice qualities. In any case... Hey, if you have any interesting side pet stories, we'd love to hear those too. Absolutely. PK, you cat UFOs, ladies out there. <laughs> uh, cat stories. I have stories. pet stories, but not side pet stories. <laughs> I had a pet pig. Did you now? What yeah. did you call it? Hamlet. Hamlet. You're great. <laughs> That's better than the buying the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, was it have anything to do with ham and bacon? No. Well, of course it did. Oh, of course. Green, green, yeah, e green eggs, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All righty. So we should sign off from yes. Shattered Reality. Okay. And um, we are going to hope to get our, um, our uh, last... Uh, guest that we couldn't get on about Santa Muerte mm -hmm. um, and uh, that was Mr. Andrew Chestnut who has written an interesting book on one of the uh, most um, strange new religious movements some people call it a cult some people call it a movement of uh, mostly Mexican and nearby Latin American countries which is called Santa Muerte now most Americans um, who are familiar with Mexico are familiar with some of the Day of the Dead sculptures mm -hmm. uh, which are um, very interesting skeletal things but lately uh, there's been a large increase in the worship of Santa Muerte. So we're going to hope that that's our next show. Uh, we had to postpone it, but we're hoping that it comes on next time. Okay, Kate. Okay. And now, what? goodbye oh, from uh, uh, Kate Valentine here saying for adios. Russia? What? From Shattered Reality. Oh, from Shattered, shattered Reality. reality. Yeah, yeah, sorry. We usually <laughs> say it together, but that's okay. <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> Bye. Yeah.